Without Wyatt, we would not be able to provide furniture when they've got no bed to sleep on, with a fridge or a washing machine when that breaks down. And that can make a huge difference to somebody. Our partnership with the Wyatt Trust has meant uh, the equivalent of around $100,000 uh, to the financial counselling service. So that is directly a appointments provided to clients within our region. It changes lives, it makes things possible and it opens up opportunities and choices for our clients. The logo of the Wyatt Trust is a tree and a tree symbolises very much uh, not only the life of Dr Wyatt but the, the life of the Wyatt Trust. It's an appropriate symbol because it reflects that uh, fact that over time uh, something is planted, it's nurtured, it's cared for and ultimately it provides protection and shelter uh, for, uh, for many, many people. William Wyatt, he was born in Plymouth in just the very beginning of the 19th century. If you think about the time, the sort of early 19th century, class was very rigid. And so once you were in, once you were in a certain strata or layer of society, that was pretty well your lot. He was born into middle class, but with aspirations, but not really ever being able to move beyond that. In 1832 in Plymouth, there was an outbreak of cholera terrifying thing for the local population because they had no defence against those kind of diseases in those days. Despite the risk, William cared for people with cholera with such courage that the community recognised his efforts and presented him with a silver snuff box carrying the inscription to William Wyatt, surgeon, in testimony of the gratitude and esteem of his fellow townsmen for his humane and unceasing attention to the poor during the awful visitation of malignant cholera at Plymouth, 1832. William was always interested in health, always interested in public health, uh, and being um, interested in training himself as a doctor, he clearly was not just interested in practicing medicine, but in generally in public health. When William was in his late 20s, he met and fell in love with Julia Darby, a very lively young woman. They were interested in getting on and they were interested in building a life. I, I think that I'm still amazed at the step that they took. They heard about the Wakefield scheme, they heard about this new possibility of a colony in South Australia, but they took the enormous step of taking this up and going to South Australia. The way in which the, um, the colonising scheme in South Australia was presented to them was in a sense a chance to make a new life, to become uh, wealthier, to get onto the land. And so it op you know, I think it offered all of these options of a, of a rise in social class and social status in this newly uh, you know, created world. The world he knows is a world which is green, it rains a lot, it has stable seasons and he comes to a place where it's as hot in winter as it is in England in summer. William would have come with a small amount of um, money, but though he was not a wealthy man, but he had enough money to participate in the very early land auctions, where he was able to buy uh, quite considerable amounts of really, really uh, good land, which then enabled him to build really quite a considerable wealth over time, and which ended up being the basis for the gift that he made to South Australia in his um, will. When the colonists came out to South Australia, they were freeing themselves from a lot of the social constraints and economic constraints also of Britain, especially in South Australia with its, all its high ideals. But it must have been quite liberating, I think also for the women as well as for the men.
William being a person who loved to be on committees and also who was very interested in the value of institutions became involved in so many different things. For instance, the new hospital, which became the Royal Adelaide Hospital, the Botanic Gardens, St Peter's College, the Holy Trinity Anglican Church. William Wyatt was also um, appointed as the Chief Inspector of Schools in South Australia and was in that position for at least 25 years. And uh, we've got an address which was given to him when he left that position expressing enormous gratitude of the work that he'd done. We understand that he was very interested in modern education and some of the new theories of education. But the thing which we found remarkable in reading about him was that his depth of understanding of Aboriginal culture. He was one of the first people to translate into Aboriginal language. He took time to learn Aboriginal language and his natural understanding of culture of the new country that he'd come to was remarkable for the time. When William built a home for his family in the Adelaide foothills, he named it Carolta, the Ghana word for on the hill. William and Julia in total had five children. One child died before they left England. Only one survived to adulthood and he was murdered actually on the property in Karata, which is pretty terrible for them. So they had no one to leave their, his wealth to. Because he was, had such a love for South Australia, he made the decision that he would give this money as a philanthropic, benevolent uh, gift to people in South Australia who had fallen on hard times. Eustace Grundy, William Wyatt's very good friend and legal advisor, wrote about him. I had the privilege of acting as Wyatt's almoner and distributing his help to many persons of the class which specially commanded his sympathy. The present scheme was the outcome of long and anxious thought on the part of the doctor. He was especially sympathetic with teachers in those schools which were in fact abolished by the state scheme of education, particularly those who were aged and unable to find employment. You'll find many of the names of them among the beneficiaries. Uh, I think Dr Wyatt was uh, particularly concerned about the ind individual cases that uh, he actually saw. And um, that, to me, would have been the reason why he wanted us to uh, use his funds for the benefit of individuals in particular, rather than have the money used up uh, in administrative costs of organisations. He really wanted to benefit the individuals because they were the people that he saw as disadvantaged. The White Trust is a perpetual trust. Uh, and so uh, when we look at uh, how we're going to uh, structure our, uh, our giving, our granting, uh, we do that in a way that ensures that that uh, perpetual nature uh, is sustained. Uh, so the, the corpus currently is around $75 million. Uh, we uh, work on the basis of a distribution of 4% of the corpus, which means that we distribute around about $3 million a year. The money's given away uh, generally through third parties. So the White works with a number of partners in South Australia who are at the coalface of helping people. And we work with them to work out exactly what people need. And so it's given away in four areas. For employment, education, financial wellbeing, which incorporates financial counselling and financial literacy, and in the area of housing, uh, an area in which Dr White had a particular interest. Well, we've got our own home. My kid's are a lot more secure, he comes home from school and if I'm not home he's got his key, he can get in and he just sits back and relaxes, does his homework, plays his PlayStation. By the time we have expenses with like your conveyances and all the other bits and pieces, we weren't sure whether or not I'd have quite enough 
with my loan, but with the trust that Wyatt Trust were giving me the grant, that was going to make sure that I actually got my house loan. So basically, I'm grateful for every penny. It's given me my home and I couldn't be happier. We're looking at grants that cover things like utility bills, so gas bills, electricity bills, um, white goods, fridges, washing machines in particular, um, and also furniture. We have uh, a number of clients who have nothing. So um, the whole idea is to set them up with something to give them a start, and Wyatt have been able to do that. We've been really able to be successful in individualising our, our funding using the white money to address the, the individual needs of each child. Because not every child needs a laptop, not every child needs clothing, not every child needs food, but we can actually target where we go along. So Wyatt have been able to provide a range of opportunities for the young people at Mount Parker High School. Career Trackers is a Indigenous internship program that places students into 12-week paid internships into Corporate Australia based on their university degrees. Gave me money to be able to pay for books and um, readers. I want to teach kids that no matter where you come from and how hard your life is, you've got to make that decision to change it and you can. Okay. We plant a seed together and it gets watered and it grows and it grows and it grows. But what's growing is change in people's lives. It's opening up choices and opportunities for people who probably thought they'd had no hope. And what the Wyatt assists Hut Street to do is open people's eyes and their opportunities to make choices and have some different options. You know, and the black and white data doesn't say, um, you know, the amount of grief and loss that someone has or the number of different um, aspects to their, you know, um, illness or addiction or financial burden that they have. And so why are always able to pick up the phone and speak to different agencies on location, for example, like us and myself, um, and find out what's happening in our local region. You know, what's what's the word around town? You know, that sort of stuff. And be able to feed that back in an informal way, but it also helps to form, um, you know, new partnerships or strengthen the ones that we currently have. The spirit of Wyatt uh, draws on the life of Dr. Wyatt himself, uh, his uh, curiosity, uh, his generosity, the spirit of stewardship that uh, embodied everything that he undertook. Uh, and in particular, uh, it draws on the intimate interactions that he had with other people. His history records an interaction with an Aboriginal man. This is 1838. The gentleman from England, the Aboriginal man from Australia, and they look together into a looking glass. They share this experience, and as they look together, they're drawn to the experience of their common humanity. And Wyatt records that in that moment, I felt he was my brother. And since that time, I've experienced more and more the secret but powerful influence that involuntarily unites every member of the great human family. <laughs>